Paul. I'm the minister here at our Gung Island Anglican Church Ford uh, location, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here and to be talking about Christmas tonight, of course, because it's Christmas Eve. I've got five kids here, and they're all very excited, as you can, can imagine, and I'm sure there's excitement around the, the houses around. Now, one way we can look at the Christmas story, and we're only just looking at a few verses of it there in, in Luke tonight, is through the different characters that come up. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to go through some of the different characters and see what they can tell us about the Christmas story. But we're just going to do the bit that we, we read, which means there's no Herod, there's no wise men, because those guys only come up in Matthew. The, there's, there's four Gospels, right? And only two of them have the Christmas story as such in it. Um, and Matthew has some things, and Luke has other things, and some of them have uh, things that are in both. But in Luke's version, there's no Herod, there's no wise men, at least at this stage, and there's no shepherds, but they are in Luke, but we just haven't read that far tonight, so we're not going to talk about them either. So the people we are going to talk about, the first one that comes up is this guy, if you can go there, thanks Micah, that's Caesar Augustus. You'll see he's mentioned in the first verse of the Bible reading that we had before there. Um, the way Colin, who we've heard from a couple of times here, likes, <laughs> likes to put it, the boss of the Romans, the Caesar, the, the head, the big guy of the Romans. And his name, his name Augustus, means the Holy One. In other words, we've got a Roman emperor here who is the God complex. He thinks he's the big boss. He thinks he's really in charge. He wants to be worshipped as a godlike man. Now, around the same time that Luke was writing these words, there was even an inscription found that called this guy, and we've got that there, the saviour... Anyone read Latin? No? The saviour of the whole world. That's what it says Augustus is. He's the saviour of the whole world. And to be fair, he was the one, if you know your, your ancient history, who brought what's called the Pax Romana, the, the peace in Rome. And they did that by basically conquering everyone. There was no one left to conquer, right? So, so there had to be peace. Now, what did Augustus do in this story? Does anyone know? This can be a bit interactive. You guys can actually call out. What does Augustus do famously in the Christmas story? And I'll repeat it for those who are online. Yes. He leads Rome, that's right. What does he do in the Christmas story? Yes, Shelley. Yes, that's right. So he orders a census, Shelley said, uh, which means that the people have to be counted and it says they had to go back to their, their ancestral homes. So that's what he does here. This is the guy calling the shots. He, 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 can you imagine at Christmas time, everyone's like, well, do you guys even know who your ancestors are? Who knows who their ancestors are or where they're from? Could you imagine just being told by the prime minister or I don't know, I couldn't imagine working on a global scale like this, but just use your imagination. You know, imagine that they just say, okay, you, to me, my, my ancestors come from Denmark, right? You know, you have to go get up and go to Denmark for Christmas. You have no choice. We're running this global census and you have to do that. I don't care if you're fifth generation Australian. <laughs> You've got to go to Denmark now, okay? That's kind of the idea of what's happening here. And he, of course, did that so he could work out how much tax to charge all the conquered people so that they could build their roads and do all the other things that they did. Okay, so that's the first person in this story. The next people in this story, of course, are Mary and Joseph. What can you tell me about Mary and Joseph? There might be a lot of things you can tell me about Mary and Joseph. Anyone? Yes, Jenny. They're engaged to be married, but they're not married yet. Thank you, yes. Yes, again, yeah. <laughs> Pledge to be married. Yeah, that, that's another way of saying that. That's good. Yeah. Have you got something, Addy? No, she's just pointing at the screen. <laughs> Excellent. That's all right. Yes, yes. They're going to have a baby. That's a very important detail. Thank you, yes. Wouldn't be a Christmas story if Mary wasn't going to have a baby, would it? We can tell... Oh, yes. They were young, yes. Yeah. So particularly, probably Mary was 
around 12 or 13 and and that's just going by that's around the age that girls got married back then we go oh but it was just normal for them they they didn't think it was there was anything anything weird about that at all we know that also that their ancestors came from Bethlehem because that's the place they had to go and that was from where they lived in the north of Israel it was about 145 k's to Bethlehem and they had to walk it I think I've got if you want to move on a bit Mike's probably a few slides keep going uh, hang on no I thought I had a map there maybe I don't that's all right I had a map of modern Israel which show it showing how how Google Maps tells you you can get there on foot um, and it says it would take a few days about three days as you could expect and that's just straight walking right so these guys packing up and they're heading to, from Nazareth to Bethlehem they're probably quite poor we know that Joseph was a tradie a builder we, we often say you know Jesus was a carpenter uh, but it's, it's a bit more ordinary than that he was a builder I, I say that as a guy who used to be a builder and he was probably the kind of builder I was I was a builder in the country where you don't have specialists who come in and do roofing or specialists who come in and do concreting or specialists who come in and do that and, or the, and this but the builder does everything from the ground up until it's finished and that's probably the sort of builder Jesus was and we know that he came from a small town called Nazareth only a couple of hundred people lived there in the north of Israel and we know not only did Mary have a baby but the, the, an angel told her that this baby was going to be God with us was going to be the saviour of the world now did we hear that phrase before? yeah that's right Augustus Caesar said he was the saviour of the world now that means we've got a bit of competition going on here doesn't it? so Jesus said or the angel said that Jesus is going to be the saviour of the world so Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Who do you think the next person to enter the story is? Kids? Yeah, get, give us it again. Herod. Oh, I did say there won't be a Herod tonight. It's a, it's a pretty obvious one, yes? Jesus, of course. They get to Bethlehem and Jesus is born. What can you tell us about Jesus being born in the Christmas story? Yes? You're my keenest subject. Excellent. He was put in a manger, which is, do you know what a manger is? Yeah? A spot where animals eat, a feeding trough, yeah. Excellent. Anything else? You're not game, are you? I was waiting for, for someone to, does, does anyone watch QI? You know where they, someone says the obvious answer and it's wrong and it goes, bah, bah, right, and you get it flashing up in red behind them. I was waiting for someone to say he was put in a barn or that the innkeeper said no because neither of those things are actually mentioned in the Bible. And uh, if you want to be a real smarty pants, if you want to get kicked out of your Christmas party this year, then tell them something like this. That it wasn't actually an innkeeper that rejected Jesus. It was his family that rejected him is probably what it's saying. The Bible just says there was no guest room available for them. They, this is likely what happened they actually went to Bethlehem and they would have stayed with family but it's the family who said no we can't have you do you get that <laughs> and you, I don't know if you know much if, if you've been to the Middle, or, Middle East or been to any of these places but where, where hospitality is so important it would be shameful to actually reject someone in that way but can you imagine rocking up to your cousin's place and they, they say, sorry, you can't stay. There's, your other cousin's got here first. It might happen, I suppose. Or they might say, you know, stay out on the veranda. And that's possibly what happened to Jesus. There's a couple of different theories. No one really knows what happened, but it's probably not likely that he was born in a barn as such, but likely a cave or something like that, or a room that was at the bottom of the house. But either way, it was a place where the animals were kept to keep them warm and dry. So as I said, you know, if you just want to be a show-off and, and a smarty pants, you can tell your rallies about that one. All right, so good work, guys. We've got the major characters in just these few verses here. Now, what do they teach us about the Christmas story? Well, we've got Emperor Augustus, the strong, powerful ruler who can tell everyone in his kingdom, go here and they go there. And they have to do it. But is he really the one who is in control of everything that's happening here? 
See, while Augustus sits comfortably in his palace, a baby is born in a house in Bethlehem. And that's a, a place that Augustus has likely never been, probably never even heard of. And this baby is placed in a feeding trough in the humblest of circumstances. But if we look way back in the Bible, we know that it's actually God that's pulling the strings here. It's not Caesar at all. It's God who is putting his plan into action. God promised King David around a thousand years before this that one of his children's 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 children and so on would be God's forever king. A king that would rule perfectly. A king that would rule forever. And we know that a prophet long before this day again promised that this king would be born in the town of Bethlehem. See, Caesar thinks he's pulling the strings, but it's God who is behind the curtain for real. Now, Augustus died a long, long time ago. And the empire that he ruled over is, is long forgotten. But Jesus still lives. And Jesus is still the king over everything. This is why we celebrate at Christmas. Luke, who wrote this biography of Jesus, put Augustus and Jesus in the same story to remind us of some important things. It's a contrast between the ruler who thought he was powerful but wasn't and the baby who didn't seem powerful but was. See, Christmas reminds us then that we're foolish to think we run our own lives. Christmas teaches us that we're not as powerful as we think, but rather we are under the rule of a powerful God. Christmas reminds us who is really in charge. Yes, he's a king, but he comes as a good and a peaceful ruler. And his birth, we see in the Bible, is good news for all people. He comes to bring peace on earth, that is by fixing our relationship with God. By what we mean by peace is that we don't have to be at war with God anymore. We can have peace with him. Jesus came for us. He loves us. He wants to show us grace. He wants to show us mercy. He wants us to be a part of his family. And that's why he sent Jesus. So that if we trust him, we can be part of his family too. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that we have reason to celebrate at Christmas. We have reason to celebrate because you are a good and loving king and you came to save us. Thank you that when things seem like they're out of control, we can know that you are in control. You know what you're doing and your plan is going to work out in the end. So please help us to trust that that's true. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.